Come on, lift up your voice. Jesus, we worship you. We bless you. We give you glory in this house today. Lord, there's none like you. None like you. Lord, you excel them all. We praise and glorify your name. We declare that this earth belongs to you and all that are in it. We declare that Jesus Christ is Lord over all the earth. Hallelujah. Lord, manifest yourself in this earth. Manifest yourself in this city, in this region. And manifest yourself in our homes, our families, and in this house today. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. Come on, just lift up a hand and give him praise right now. Hallelujah. For I heard these words come up in my spirit. The hand of the Lord is not too short, nor is his ear too quiet, that he cannot hear, that he cannot do what he has promised he will do. For even in this day and in this year, you will see the mighty hand of the Lord. He shall move in your life in ways that you have not seen before. For the Lord says, I do a new thing, a fresh thing in the earth. Do not look for a repeat of yesterday, but look for a fresh thing. For I will move in new ways. I'll give new direction. I'm going to give new assignments. I hear the Lord giving fresh clarity. And also, I just see him handing out new assignments, almost like a, like a sergeant going and saying, now, these are your orders now, these are your orders now, these are your orders now. And as you listen to the Lord and as you press into him, you will get fresh direction from the Lord. New adventures that he wants you to take, new places he wants you to go in your life. And if you'll follow the Spirit and do what he says, you will be blessed. For the direction of the Lord is what the hand of the Lord will come upon you to do. He'll guide you to do what he puts in your heart. So rejoice and lift up your voice and know that God is at work in the earth. He's at work in your life. His hand is upon you and he will do all that he has commanded concerning you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. You know, several years ago, I did a series called The Hand of the Lord. You can listen to it on the app. And the Lord took me through the Bible and showed me that throughout the Old and the New Testament, the Scripture speaks of God's hand, which is His Spirit moving on people. The hand of the Lord can come upon you to do, to do extraordinary things. The Bible said when the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah, he outran the chariots of Ahab. The Bible said the hand of the Lord came upon the prophet and he proclaimed things that were to come. And the hand of the Lord is on the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's going to move by his hand in fresh and new ways. And when the Lord does it, no one has to say, I wonder if that's God. Because God's hand is able to do exactly what he intends for it to do. Amen. So just lift up your hand and say, Father, I receive the hand of the Lord. Come upon me, anoint me, assist me, speak to me, guide me, heal me, 
Use me for your glory in Jesus' name. Now give him a shout of praise. Thank you, Father. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Father. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. Well, that hand's in this house today. Praise the Lord. Turn to two or three people and say, the hand of the Lord is on you. And you can be seated. Oh, it is so good to be in church. God is so good. Um, I just want to take a minute to greet those who are visiting with us in this first service today. Those who are here in this sanctuary. Those who are also uh, attending in Life Chapel, uh, our other auxiliary uh, facility right here in the building. And whether you're watching by screen or you're watching at home or somewhere else, I want you to know the Lord is with you. We're glad that you're here today. It's not a mistake that you tuned in. And we want to say a special greeting to our online guests, folks all over New York, Buffalo, New York City, Rochester. Also, uh, folks that are watching live from Durham, uh, New Hampshire, uh, Boston, Massachusetts, Norfolk, Virginia, Pasaukin Township, Pennsylvania, Detroit, Michigan, Independence, Missouri, Atlanta, Georgia, Hardysville, South Carolina, Windsor, Connecticut, Newport, Ritchie, Florida, Jensen Beach, Florida, Mexico City, Mexico, and other places around the world. Welcome. Good to have you with us. Let's give a big shout out to all of our online members and guests. Praise the Lord. And I just want to remind you, if you're visiting with us today in this service, after every service, if you're here on campus, we have a special area to receive you. We have a gift we want to give you as our guest, and it's called the next area. It's right outside of the sanctuary to the right. Take, your, take a moment to step in there. Our ministry leaders would love to get to hear your story, get to know you, pray for you if you have any needs, and give you this special gift that we've prepared for you. And again, it may not be your first day, but maybe you've never made it back. You've been exploring uh, our church, and you've never made it to the next room. Go on back there today. We'd love to say hello. And one more time, let's welcome all of our guests on campus and online. God bless you. Good to have you with us today. Praise the Lord. Well, if you have your Bible with you, I'd like you to uh, take it and hold it over your head, and we're going to begin by just getting right into the Word of God. The Bible tells us that His Word is living and powerful. So when we approach the reading and the study of the Scripture, we're believing that the Holy Spirit is going to come alive and provide power to us as we read it, the power to receive what the promises of God declare. So as you hold up your Bible, say this out loud, this is my Bible. It works for me. It, 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 does what, it does what God's Word says it will do. And I believe today the Word of God will come into my life, renew my mind, give me hope and power to live for Him. Move in my life today, Father. By your word, in Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. All right, I'd like you to open up your Bible this morning. We're going to get right into the teaching of God's word. Over the next three weeks, as we lead up to Palm Sunday, we're going to be teaching about the Holy Spirit. And today, I'm going to talk to you about the person of the Holy Spirit. Next week, we're going to talk about the presence of the Holy Spirit, and then we're going to talk about the power of the Holy Spirit. But this message today is essential. You know, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, lots of us have different ideas and thoughts concerning what the Spirit is. Even in the secular world, you see people talking, people that don't know the Lord, and they talk about, oh, the Spirit's moving me. I feel the Spirit. And a lot of times, uh, they don't know exactly what they're saying. And I want to be very clear today, my assignment, my role today in this service is to make a strong defense for who the Holy Spirit is as a divine person, as the third member of the Godhead. The Holy Spirit is God. And we're going to see that he is the member of the Godhead that is actively working in the life of the believer today. Everything that God has ever done for you or you ever hope to have 
from God, anything he would ever do for you, he does through the agency, the action of this person called the Holy Spirit. And the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit is revealed to us. When you go through the scriptures in the Old Testament, you'll see references to the Holy Spirit. In fact, the Holy Spirit shows up in the very first two verses of the Bible in the book of Genesis. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was out without form and void and darkness covered the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. In the very beginning, with the Father, we have the Holy Spirit hovering over the face of the waters. He was present at the beginning of creation. The Bible tells us throughout the Old Testament as we see God manifest himself, as we see God bring judgment, as we see God anoint kings and priests and prophets, the Bible speaks of this spirit, God's spirit. But there isn't a lot of information. We see what the spirit does, but we don't know too much about who he is. In the Old Testament, we also see that that God promises that someday he's going to send his Savior, his Messiah. And so after the Old Testament era was over, the next person of the Godhead that was introduced to us is Jesus. The Father, God, is the primary visible actor in the Old Testament. We see the Holy Spirit there, we see Jesus there, but we don't know too much about Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And then yet in the New Testament, Jesus, the second person of the Godhead, steps into a physical human life, is born of the Virgin Mary, and lives a miraculous and supernatural life, goes to the cross, and takes his place as our Redeemer. He dies and pays the price through his blood for our sins. He takes our sins on himself on the cross, and then in the resurrection of the dead, Jesus gives the hope of salvation to the whole human race. Hallelujah. And so the four Gospels are the testimony of Jesus. We see Jesus in the Old Testament, but predominantly it is God who is the actor that we see most clearly in the Old Testament. But in the Gospels, Jesus is revealed. This wonderful second person of the Godhood who existed with God in the beginning, who himself has always been God. And Jesus reveals his glory, his nature. There's no gospel that talks about the greatness of Jesus, the the, the glory of Jesus, more than the gospel of John. And so Jesus reveals the Father, but he himself is his own person. And yet we see this other one in the ministry of Jesus. When Jesus goes to be baptized by John in the Gospel of Mark chapter 1 and the Gospel of Luke, the Bible tells us that that as he was baptized, a voice came out of heaven and the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove. And the voice said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Well, if a voice is saying, this is my son, who's speaking? Is the son speaking? Would the son say, this is my beloved son? No. No. It's another person. And so we see the father now identifying Jesus as his son, the second person of the Godhead. And as he's identifying his son, this other comes and rests upon him, known as the Holy Spirit. Spirit. So we see him appearing. In the baptism of Jesus, we see the mystery of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, portrayed but not fully explained. Jesus lives his life, and the disciples saw him do miracles. They witnessed the Holy Spirit moving, but it wasn't until the very last night of his life that Jesus decided to introduce his disciples to this other person, this other aspect of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. So we're going to go right to the words of Jesus in John chapter 14, and let's begin to take a look at what Jesus introduces to us. John chapter 14, and let's start by looking at verse 1. Jesus is speaking to the 12 disciples. 
He just had the last supper with them. He's walking with them to the Garden of Gethsemane. And he's giving them some final instructions. He knows he's going to die. He's been telling them this, and he's preparing them. And he says in verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. See, God, me. Can you see? God, me. Two persons. Doesn't mean Jesus is another God, but Jesus is the second member of the Godhead. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm leaving. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, that is in the Father's house, there you may be also. That's why we know when a believer dies, they go to the Father's house. So where do I go when I die? If you're a born-again believer, you go to the exact same place that Jesus is. The exact same place. The Father's house. And he's already up there preparing a mansion, a dwelling place for you. Hallelujah. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, and how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father, in other words, the Father's house or heaven, except by me. Only through Jesus. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Now, that's an interesting statement. And Philip said, Lord, show us the father. It's sufficient for us. And Jesus said, have I not, have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? He said, show me the father. Jesus said, you haven't, I've been here all this time and you haven't known me. He who has seen me has seen the father. So how can you say, show us the father? Do you not believe, now notice this, that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? It doesn't mean that there's only one person who's pretending to take two roles. There are two persons, but those two persons are intricately related in one divine entity, one divine being. So if you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father because Jesus is the exact representation of the Father in a body. Hallelujah. Now he goes on to say, uh, believe in me, verse 11, that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these will he do, because I go to my Father. Jesus said, I'm leaving, but my leaving is going to open a door for you to continue the miraculous works and ministry that you've been a part of for the last three and a half years. Most assuredly, I say to you, I'm sorry, verse uh, 13, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now, if you love me, keep my commandments. Verse 16, now here we go. Here's the introduction. And I will pray to the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Jesus says, I'm leaving, but it's good for you that I leave because I'm going to go and talk to the Father and ask the Father to send another, capital A. You see, they had known God the Father through the Old Testament prophets and through the works of God in the Old Testament. They had come to know Jesus the Son through his life and ministry, and through Jesus, they got to know the Father even better. So the ministry of Jesus not only introduced the Son of God, but the Son of God gave greater clarity to the person of the Father himself. But Jesus said, I'm now leaving the earth See, God was on the earth in the Old Testament. Jesus is on the earth in the Gospels, but now Jesus is going to go to the right hand of the Father, and he's going to send another. There's someone else. And this word another is a Greek word that means another of the same kind, another one just like me, another one who's just like me. And his name 
is the spirit of truth. Hallelujah. And when he comes, he's not just going to be around you. He's actually going to be in you. Hallelujah. And over the rest of this sermon, John 14, 15, 16, and 17, Jesus speaks about this helper, the Holy Spirit, who he is and what he will do. Now, before we break into who the Holy Spirit is based on these scriptures, I want to tell you what the Holy Spirit is not. All right, this is very important that you hear this. There are many people today, including other religious systems that call themselves Christian, that do not adhere to the biblical teaching about the person of the Holy Spirit. One group, and we love our friends, but, but, but we differ strongly in this point, is the Jehovah Witnesses, who declare the Holy Spirit is a force like electricity or a power, not a person. You're going to see today how absolutely incorrect that is. There are other folks who talk about the Holy Spirit in the New Age movement, or even people who kind of mix Christianity and Hinduism, Buddhism, and a lot of other isms, and they talk about the Holy Spirit as if he was some sort of, a, of an energy. But we're going to see he's much more than that. So I want you to make a quick list of these things. Seven things the Holy Spirit is not. Number one, the Holy Spirit is not the same as your spirit. It's not the same. He's not the same as your spirit. When we speak in the scripture about the Holy Spirit, he is himself a divine personality, but you have your own spiritual nature. When you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit comes to live in your spirit, and now you are in him and he is in you, but it doesn't mean you lose your identity. You have your own spirit. The Holy Spirit is a separate spirit. Very important that you understand that because there's some today that teach in some of the new age philosophies that we all are spirit. We all have the Holy Spirit. And in that sense, we are, our spirits are the same thing as the Holy Spirit and whatever they say the Holy Spirit is. No, the Holy Spirit is a person. He is separate. He is distinct from you and your spirit. Number two, the Holy Spirit is not an it. I cannot tell you how many times I hear Christians say, I felt the Spirit. It was so strong. It. Well, I know they mean it, the presence, the power, but the Holy Spirit is a he. He, the Spirit of truth. He, he's a person, and he has all the attributes of personality. Don't call the Holy Spirit it. Number three, the Holy Spirit is not a feeling. Sometimes people talk about, I, they get inspired, they feel a little excited, they get some goosebumps, and they say, I, I'm feeling the Spirit. Well, the Holy Spirit can, when he's manifesting himself, inspire physical reactions like that. It's very true. But the Holy Spirit is not a feeling. Some people feel like if they're, if they're you know, jerking and jumping, and you know, that means that they got the Spirit. And uh, I'm just going to be straight with you. Can I just be honest with you? Not to be critical. Sometimes when a person first encounters the Holy Spirit, the physical body has to acclimate to it, and the physical body can respond in some unusual ways. But that isn't the normal thing. People who are still jerking, jumping, and being an ah, and whoop, every time the Holy they've got to grow up. Control yourself. He doesn't, he, he doesn't make you look like you're doing the robot every time he comes upon you. I'm not saying you might not have a moment where you jerk and jump and fall. I'm just saying if that's what every, and, and if you think that when you jerk, that means the Holy Spirit's present, the presence of the Holy Spirit isn't about some physical manifestation in your body. So just tone it down. I love you. Number four, the Holy Spirit is not a force. You know, it's very common to think, especially, and it's, it's related to the Eastern religions that have taken over in much of the world, this idea of yin and yang, of this great force. We saw it in Star Wars, and some people thought it was actually religious truth, that there is one great force, this energy, that is both, you know, good and dark, and the Holy Spirit is not this force, this power, this universal kind of intelligence that has no personality. The Holy Spirit is a person. He's not a force. He has 
power. He has force. He creates forces that enable things to happen, but he's not just a force like you would think of gravity or electricity. Number five, the Holy Spirit is not just an attribute of God the Father. Recently, I was listening to the teaching of a pastor who is not too far from here, who pastors a a, a successful church, and I'm not judging my brother, but he literally taught heresy on the subject of the Holy Spirit. In his efforts to explain the Holy Spirit, he said the Holy Spirit is not a person. He's not a separate person. The Holy Spirit is just God the Father's Spirit. And so when you hear about the Holy Spirit or the Spirit, it's just the Father and his own spiritual energy acting. Well, the problem is the Father is Spirit, but the Scripture teaches the Holy Spirit is not just the Father in spiritual form. The Holy Spirit is a Spirit equal to the Father, in fellowship with the Father, and is another And so don't buy into this idea that the Holy Spirit is just an attribute of God the Father. The Holy Spirit is as much a person as Jesus is a person. And the mistakes that we can make is either to confound the Trinity in such a way that we don't see the three persons of God, or to separate the Trinity in such a way that we uh, emphasize the distinctions and forget the unity. The balance of the Christian revelation about God is that we have one God who's manifested himself in three divine persons. The Spirit is God, the Son is God, the Father is God. But the Spirit is not the Son, and the Son is not the Spirit, and the Spirit is not the Father. Yet we do not have three gods, we have one God manifested in three persons. How does that work? Just receive it and enjoy it. Praise the Lord. Number six, the Holy Spirit was not created. God didn't think, you know, the first thing I'm going to do is create a force or a person called the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, God created the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has always existed with the Father and with the Son. There was no creation point of Jesus. There was no creation point of the Spirit. Jesus, the Son, was born into the earth. There was a moment where the Son of God assumed a human nature that did have a moment. But long before Jesus became flesh or took on a human form, Jesus was with the Father as a separate person in the Godhead. Amen. And so was the Holy Spirit. Finally, the Holy Spirit, and this just is a repetition of what I just emphasized, is not another God. He's another person of the Godhead. Everybody say he's another person of the one triune God. Hallelujah. Now let's talk for just a minute about what it means to be a person. The definition of a person is this. A person is a being who has certain capacities and attributes, such as reason, morality, consciousness, and is capable of relationship with another. A person is a relational being. A person has their own sense, they have their own voice, they have their own mind, they have their own consciousness. So when we say that the Holy Spirit is a person, we're saying that the Holy Spirit is in fact a conscious, thinking, reasoning, capable of acting, relational being. Hallelujah. The Bible speaks of some of the attributes of the Holy Spirit and attributes to the Holy Spirit the same great three attributes that are attributed to Jesus and the Father. All Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all three, are omniscient, which means they know everything that can be known. They know everything at once, everything in the past, every future thing that will happen, that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit do not lack any knowledge at all all-knowing. Number two, they're all-powerful. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have all power. There's nothing that they are incapable of doing except they are incapable, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, of acting against their morality and, and human nature or a spiritual nature. They can't act against their attributes. So the Holy Spirit is filled with power, filled with 
ability, and there's nothing the Spirit of God can't do. Whatever the Father can do, the Holy Spirit can do. And when the Father does things, he does them by the power of the Holy Spirit. The third attribute of God is that God is uh, omnipresent, which means God is everywhere present in the universe, in the visible and the invisible worlds at once. There's no place in the visible world or the invisible world that we cannot see where God is not present. He's everywhere in time and space at once. Hallelujah. And that's what makes God so wonderful to know because there's nothing he doesn't know, there's nothing he cannot do, and there's nowhere that he is absent. Hallelujah. Finally, the Holy Spirit has a personal relationship with the Father and the Son. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit occupy a divine council and together created the plan of salvation. The Father deciding the plan, the Son executing the plan, and the Holy Spirit revealing the plan. Everything we do is in relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When a believer is baptized in Matthew 28, Jesus said, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Because the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are the three persons that constitute the one God who saves us. Hallelujah. Now, I want to talk to you about the role of the Holy Spirit in the time we have left. And we're going to find these different roles of the Holy Spirit right in the Scriptures as we read them. The first thing I want to say about the Holy Spirit's purpose and mission is that he was sent into the world to give believers the new birth. To give believers the new birth. In John 3, in verse 6, Jesus said, You must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. Verse 6 says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Your flesh was born of the flesh of your parents. But when you're born again, it is the Holy Spirit who gives birth to your spirit. Everybody say, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. The Spirit, in the Greek, it's the word ho, the definite article, the Holy Spirit, is your spirit. When your person is born again, the Holy Spirit regenerates you, gives you new life. It's described in Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy, he has saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. When you're born again, God regenerates, brings new life to your spiritual nature. And the Holy Spirit is the agent of God that makes you born again. There's no such thing as a believer who doesn't have the Holy Spirit. The moment you believe in Christ, the Holy Spirit gives you new birth. You are born of the Spirit. Jesus said to the woman at the well, he said, the water that I give you shall become a well of water springing up to everlasting life. This was the Holy Spirit. He said, I'm going to give you the Spirit. He's going to be a well of water that will spring up and give from the inside of you eternal life. You will never perish. How many of you are glad for the Holy Spirit who gives us new birth, makes us children of God? If you're a Christian, if you believe in Jesus, the Spirit of God is in you right now. You may not, have, you may not do any other miraculous work or feat the rest of your life, but you can know this. The greatest miracle that any person can receive isn't a healing of their body, a special word of knowledge, some great miraculous event. The greatest miracle any person can receive is to be born of the Holy Spirit, to have your sinful nature removed and to receive a brand new nature, to become a new creature in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. The second role of the Holy Spirit that we want to look at, the Bible says that he not only saves us, makes us new creatures, gives us a new spirit, but he seals the believer. In 2 Corinthians 1.22, listen to this word. Who has sealed us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Everybody say he has sealed us 
and given us the Holy Spirit. Paul puts it this way in Ephesians chapter 1. He says, you have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of your redemption. When a person is born again, not only does the Holy Spirit give you a new nature, but he actually comes to live inside of you, puts on his welding glasses, and he seals himself inside of you. Literally, you are sealed. Your salvation, the presence of the Holy Spirit is permanently sealed into the believer. And the Bible tells us for how long? Until the day where God redeems his purchased possession, which is the day where Jesus appears and we get resurrected bodies. He never leaves the spirit of the believer. Hallelujah. Just turn to somebody and say, I've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. Aren't you glad? Man, I, 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 listen, I might tamper with that seal. Right? Other people can try to tamper with that seal. The devil could try to break that seal. It's unbreakable because it was God who sealed it. Hallelujah. Number three, the Holy Spirit is not just in us as a saving force and not just in us as a sealing force. He is in us to help us. He is our helper. We read it in John 14, 16. Listen to it again. I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper another helper. Over five times, the Lord refers to the Holy Spirit in these passages as our helper. Now, the Greek word translated helper, I'm going to give you just one little Greek word, you can handle it, and it's this word, paraclete. The word para means next to. A parasite is a, is a, is a, an organism that is next to or alongside some other place in your body feeding off the same thing your organs are feeding off of. A parallel line or two lines next to each other. So this Greek word para means to be next to, side by side with. This word cleat comes from the Greek word kletos, or, and that comes from this word kaleo, which means to call to someone who is far off and to call them by name and say, come here, come here. When you put these two words together, paraclete literally means the one who is called alongside you to assist you, to help you, to advocate for you, to do whatever is required in your service. Hallelujah. Tim, come on up here. Tim is a believer. All right? When Tim got born again, the Holy Spirit gave him a new heart and jumped inside of him forever. But he not just he doesn't just live in there as a hitchhiker. Is kind of holding on until the ride is over. He's in there to be a parakletos, which means God didn't just put the Spirit in you to save you. He called the Holy Spirit to be alongside you and to do whatever is necessary to help you. He is there to help. This word can be translated advocate. You've got an advocate. One translation, and, and, and it's not, it, it fails in some aspects, but the way we think sometimes of a concierge, one who is there to do whatever the customer needs. Now, he's not just a servant of the believer. You understand that. He's a Lord, too. But he is there to serve us and to help us whatever we need. If we stumble, it's the Holy Spirit who convicts us. If we, and it's the Holy Spirit that points us towards Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit that restores us. It's the Holy Spirit that does everything in the believer's life. He is your helper. Hallelujah. And he'll never leave you. Praise God. Aren't you glad? I want you to get that picture. Thank you, Tim. I want you to get that picture in your mind. He's been called right alongside to help you in life. And I'm sure that this job of helping you and me is challenging at times. I'm confident, I can just speak for myself, I'm confident that the helper has probably rolled his eyes more than once. But he is never going to leave my side because it was the Father who called him and Jesus who sent him to be right alongside me 
forever. Hallelujah. Turn to somebody and say, whatever you need, he's there to help. Now look in John 16 and verse 13. John 16 and verse 13, we find several attributes of the Holy Spirit in this one verse. It says, however, when he, notice he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. In this one verse, there are four attributes that we can see about the Holy Spirit's role in your life as a believer. First of all, he will never lie to you. He is the spirit of truth. He never lies. If you've heard a voice and it's a lie, it's not the spirit of God. It's a familiar spirit. It's a demonic spirit. It's maybe your own head or someone else's spiritual thoughts, but the Holy Spirit will only speak the truth to you. We can never be misled by the Holy Spirit. Second of all, he guides us. He said he will guide you into all truth. A guide is someone who directs you. He doesn't put you on his back and do the walking for you. He guides you. He's with you. He might go ahead and say, this is the way. He might do a little bushwhacking and and tell this is the way we're going to go. And he's guiding you guiding you. Sometimes the Holy Spirit is, is like, a, like a, a gentle uh, voice behind you, tapping on your shoulder, turn right, turn left. Sometimes the Holy Spirit jumps out in front of us and just has to hack away, and we just have to walk really close with him and follow him through the difficulties and the trials of life. But he is a guide. Turn to somebody and say, I can expect to be guided by the Holy Spirit. He wants to guide you in your finances. He wants to guide you in your marriage. He wants to guide you in your emotions. He wants to guide you in how to get victory over your flesh. There's nothing that you may have need of that he doesn't have a guidance for, direction for, counsel for, and advice for. Can you say amen? Amen. The next thing we see from the same verse is that he speaks. Whatever he hears, he will speak. This is another reason we know the Holy Spirit isn't some force or energy. He's a person because only persons have a voice. The Holy Spirit has a voice and he speaks what the Father says to him. He hears the Father's counsel with Jesus and it's almost like the Father and Jesus in heaven are are talking about you and the Holy Spirit is sort of like he's there listening, and his job is now to tell you what he hears. He's giving you insight into the secret counsels of the Father and Jesus concerning your life. He's there to repeat. He's a leaker in the most wonderful way. And if we'll learn to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, if we'll learn to become familiar with it, we can hear God's voice when we listen to the Spirit's voice because he only speaks what he hears from the Father. Turn to somebody and say, the Holy Spirit will speak to me and I have the ability to hear him. That second part is really important. You can believe the first part but not the second part. A lot of times we feel like there's no way I can hear God. I got too much stuff in my life. There's too many noises and things can drown out our, our, can definitely dull our ears and make it difficult to hear the spirit. But I want you to know if you're born again inside of you, you have a receiving device. You have an auditory device in your spirit that is capable of picking up whatever the Holy Spirit is saying. Sometimes you've got to get quiet. Sometimes you've got to put aside the indulgence of the flesh. That's what Lent's about, setting aside pleasures and indulgences, fasting at least a day a week, so that we can get some of the distractions out of our life to quiet our bodies and minds so that the Spirit's voice becomes clear. Hallelujah. There's a lot of voices that compete with the voice of the Holy Spirit today, and they're in your pocket 24 hours a day, seven days a week. No generation has ever had to compete with so many voices in their pocket. I mean, you probably, you know, we get butt dialed how many times a week? Right? All these voices, but listen, there's, there's, there's a voice that's more important than the buzz in your butt or the buzz on your wrist or the notification that pops up on your screen. There is a voice that is the voice of the Holy Spirit. 
silence as many of those voices as you can and make time in your life to listen to him because he is speaking. He is speaking. The final characteristic of the Holy Spirit in this verse that we see is that he will tell you things to come. That means the Holy Spirit prepares us for the future. This is important. That doesn't mean that we're going to know everything that's going to happen before it happens. Even those of us who are used from the, by the Lord in prophecy and the prophet's ministry, we only see a little piece. We only see part. Sometimes we get it wrong. But each believer can hear from the Holy Spirit. And I want you to know this. God did not put prophets in prophecy in the New Testament church to be the primary source for guidance in your life. Thank God for words of prophecy. Thank God for people who have the gifts of prophecy and can speak an encouraging word. But in the New Testament, we are to be led by the Holy Spirit. You don't need a pastor, a prophet, or a teacher to tell you the will of God. If you'll learn to listen to your spirit and you'll read the word and study the word of God, the Holy Spirit, through the word of God, will give you what you need to know from God. Prophets and prophecy come alongside to encourage and confirm. Confirm what God is already saying to your spirit. I'm going to say this to you. If somebody calls themselves a prophet and comes up and gives you a word and and it's like totally out of the blue and it doesn't, and it's, they're giving you some future direction and it does, it's nothing you've ever thought of or heard of before. It feels foreign to you. Don't, don't eat it. Don't put it on your plate and gobble it up. Because most of the time, prophecy is not predictive. And when it is predictive, it is usually only to confirm what God has already been speaking in your heart. It's a confirmation. But there's a lot of Christians today that are enamored with prophecy and prophets and go to prophets to get direction instead of going to the Word and the Holy Spirit. God did not put prophets in the church to be the New Testament fortune tellers. They're not the psychics of the local church. It's a totally different thing. Oh, this is important. And I say this because there has been an abuse of the prophetic anointing, an abuse of prophecy, an abuse of the prophetic spirit. I'm going to say this too. God did not put prophets in the church to tell us who's going to win an election or to tell you who to vote for. They are crossing into a false spirit. It is not the purpose of the church to interfere with the things of the world. We should hear the Holy Spirit, we should vote our conscience, and and most of the time if we study the Word of God and know the issues, it's clear what to vote. But when we start getting into a place where we start pushing an agenda or using the Holy Spirit to lift up a political party or politician of any kind, we're mixing things that ought not to be mixed. Our kingdom is not of this world. And like Forrest Gump, that's about all I'm going to say about that. (laughs) In John 16, Jesus goes on to tell us about this wonderful helper, the Holy Spirit. In verse 7, he says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Two principles I want you to see. First of all, the Holy Spirit takes the place of the physical body of Jesus until Jesus physically returns. He said, I'm going away, and if I don't go away, I can't do this, so I'm going away so I can send you the helper, and he's going to come in my place. I'm leaving, I'm tapping him in, he's coming. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead, and he's the one that's active on the earth today. Jesus' physical body is at the right hand of God in heaven. Someday he's going to stand up from that throne, and he's going to physically return to the earth. That's the promise of God. In the meantime, God tapped in the Holy Spirit. God the Spirit is dwelling on the earth with us today. Jesus is with us through the Holy Spirit. We are in Christ through the Holy Spirit. He's the person that connects us with heaven, and heaven is connected to us 
through the Holy Spirit. The second principle I want you to see, and this is the ninth attribute if you're counting, is that he convicts the world of sin. Part of the job of the Holy Spirit is to let people who do not know Christ become aware that there is such a thing as sin. Did you know unbelievers can feel conviction of sin? They can feel that something is wrong. In fact, God has put a conscience in every human being. And every human being, even without religious, spiritual, or moral training, knows intuitively that murder is wrong, lying is wrong, stealing is wrong. Amen. Bearing false witness is wrong. Adultery is wrong. It's in us. We know our, our own hearts Even the unsaved person has the capacity to know that what they're doing can be condemned, to know that there's a a better way, a higher way. And that's what all the religions of the world outside of Christ are looking for. They're looking for some way to, to alleviate the moral guilt that every human has, knowing that there was something we were created for that we've fallen far short of. And the Holy Spirit is there to convict. Now listen, when you're dealing with an unsaved loved one, family member, or coworker, someone you care about who isn't yet born again, and, and, and I want you to get this, it's not your job to convict them of their sin. It's not the job of the church to stand up and to proclaim how sinful the world is. These These... I'm going to say it, fools who, get it, who come from some of these churches that stand out in front, of, in front of places of sin and they hold placards and they call names. That is not the Holy Spirit. He, he convicts the unbeliever of sin without removing his dignity. The Holy Spirit doesn't call names. The Holy Spirit speaks truth. And if we will live in the relationship, we're called to walk in with the Holy Spirit and do our best to live right before God. And when we fall, we get up, we receive God's mercy, and we keep going. The Holy Spirit, through our perpetual enduring witness, uses our witness for good to convict the world that they need Christ. But you don't have to do that. And I want to say, if you have an unsaved husband or wife that's at home, you don't have to, you know, leave the, the, the iPod playing or, or download certain t- teachings from me or, or someone else that you like. Don't try to do the Holy Spirit's work for him. Just live the life God's called you to live. Live a joyful life. Live a present life. Be engaged. It's good to pray. It's good to come to church. But you know what? If you've got unsaved loved ones at home, you need to go home and do more than pray. You need to to be present. You need to love your family and serve your family. And as you live right before God, the Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin. Just turn to somebody and say, the Holy Ghost has got it. He's big enough. It's not your job. It's not your job to tell the world they're sinful. Hallelujah. Are you ready? Look in John 16 and verse 14. It says this. It says, he will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. Not only does Jesus, does the Holy Spirit tell us what the Father is saying to him, the Holy Spirit tells us what Jesus is saying to him. Hallelujah. And he glorifies Jesus. This is important. If the Holy Spirit is working in your life, he will always point to Jesus. He doesn't point to himself, he points to Jesus. Sometimes there are revivals and moves of the Holy Spirit where there are great manifestations and people start getting these experiences that are wonderful with the Holy Spirit. But I want you to know that when the Holy Spirit sends a miraculous revival, he doesn't do it so the cameras should be focused on the people and their manifestations. And that was one of the great errors of the last great revival or one of the last great revivals that we saw in the 90s and the 2000s is people became fascinated with manifestations. The Holy Spirit doesn't point to you. As I said, you're jerking, you're flipping, you're flopping, you're dancing or anything. He points to Jesus, to Jesus. And so sometimes men get in the way when God is moving. They get enamored with the Holy Spirit and forget that the Holy Spirit's moving to bring us to Christ. He glorifies Jesus. Anything the Holy Spirit does is to draw you to Jesus. Now think of it this way. Jesus points to the Father. We go to the Father through the name, through the blood of Jesus. The Holy Spirit points to Jesus. Hallelujah. He'll always point to Jesus. And I'm going to say this. The Holy Spirit isn't going to point to to the Holy Mother Mary. 
The Holy Spirit's not pointing to St. Christopher. The Holy Spirit isn't pointing to some other dead Christian. The Holy Spirit is pointing only to Jesus. There is one God and one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus. Hallelujah. You want to feel the Holy Spirit? Start worshiping Jesus. I'm telling you, I've seen it in my life over and over again. Been down, been discouraged, been depressed, fighting thoughts, overwhelming thoughts. And, and, and I just stop and say, Jesus, I love you. I don't feel it, but I just say, Jesus, I worship you. And I'll start singing a song to Jesus, glorifying Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. It washes white as snow. And I'll just start singing about And I'll tell you, you cannot worship and sing about Jesus and not have the Holy Spirit show up. It attracts him. And then he'll anoint your worship to become even more powerful. Hallelujah. Thank God for this work of the Holy Spirit to glorify Jesus. Now we're almost done, but I want to give you a few more things in the book of Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, it tells us that the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're the children of God. That means the Holy Spirit gives us assurance that we're God's children. If the Spirit of God in you is constantly present to remind you that you have a father in heaven, that you have a relationship with him. And when you stumble and when you fall, he bears witness. He also helps us by bearing witness in life to the things that are his will and plan for us. So this is how the spirit of God works. His spirit bears witness to our spirit. It's like the spirit of man and the spirit of God in the born again believer are communicating. And when your spirit, you get a witness in your spirit, that's the Holy Spirit saying yes. Or sometimes you get a witness in your spirit that's restrictive. It says, no, this isn't the way. Either way, a big go or a big no, that's the Holy Spirit bearing witness to your spirit. Follow the witness of your spirit, the intuition of your heart, and you'll you'll follow God every single time. Now, the Bible says in Romans 8, 26, The Spirit helps us in our weaknesses when we don't know what to pray for as we should. The Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. The Holy Spirit actually helps us to pray. He intercedes for us and he intercedes through us. When you and I don't know how to pray about a situation in our life, a problem that we're facing, when we don't know how to pray uh, to get a solution in life, the Holy Spirit is in you to help you to pray. And when a person receives what we call the special infilling of the Holy Spirit, God gives us an ability to worship him in a language we've never learned, and the Holy Spirit will give you fresh words to pray. He prays through you the perfect will of God. Which brings us to the next point. The Holy Spirit fills us with his power. The Holy Spirit fills us with his power. In Acts Chapter 1 and verse 8, Jesus said, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you'll be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. The Holy Spirit has, he is not, he's not the, he's not just power, but he is powerful. He has power. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, there is a power in you that comes to be a witness to others. Now, this is important. The Bible speaks of being born of the Spirit. That's to be born again. And when you're born of the Spirit, you have the power to be a child of God. But the Bible also speaks of being filled with the Spirit. And when you're filled with the Spirit, you receive power to be a witness. In the new birth, you have the power to be a child of God. In the baptism in the Holy Spirit, you have the power to minister to others. The Holy Spirit wants to fill born-again believers with his power so that our gifts can be operating and we can be a witness to Christ in the world. Every believer ought to believe for this wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit, this wonderful baptism. It's not a different spirit. It's the same spirit, but it's a deeper experience with the Holy Spirit. And we're going to be praying for people to receive this gift of the Holy Spirit in just a couple of weeks. Hallelujah. Finally, the Holy Spirit gives us spiritual gifts. Everybody say he gives us spiritual gifts. In 1 Corinthians 12, 4, it says there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. And verse 7 says the manifestation of the Holy Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. 
And one and the same Spirit works these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Every one of us receive a gift from the Holy Spirit when you're born again. And there are other gifts of the Spirit. Sometimes God can use us in very in wonderful gifts. You can read all about it in 1 Corinthians 12, some of those wonderful gifts. But we as Christians need to believe for the power of the Holy Spirit, not just to work in our lives for us, but to work through us to be a blessing to other people. Can you say amen? The gifts of the Holy Spirit. He's there to enable us, to gift us, to do extraordinary things for his glory and honor. And the Bible says in Romans 8, 11, that if the spirit of, of him who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. That means the Holy Spirit not only saves you, seals you, keeps you, helps you, directs you, guides you, speaks to you, convicts you, aids you, but the, fills you, empowers you, gives you gifts, but the Holy Spirit will someday, when Jesus returns, give life to your mortal body. You will get a new body. When Jesus returns, if you're in heaven, you're going to come back and get a brand new body. If you're on earth when Jesus returns, your physical body will be changed in an instant and your body will be like Jesus' glorious body. That's the final work of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life. And it's coming soon to a planet near you. Hallelujah. Have you been blessed by the word of God today? I want you to stand up all over this house and let's begin to thank God for the wonderful gift and person of the Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you, we glorify you, we praise you. We give you honor. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that you've given to us to be our teacher, to be our guide. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that gives us new birth. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that fills us. Father, we want every gift that you have planned for us. Lord, there may be spiritual gifts that you want to give to people in this room today that they may not choose for themselves. But Lord, if you choose it for us, we want it. We want it. Just say this to the Lord. Say, Lord, I want everything you have for me. Now I want to address the Holy Spirit. He is a person and he hears as well as speaks. And I just want you to say, Holy Spirit of God, thank you for your work in my life. I want to know you better. Help me to gain victory, to hear the voice of the Father, to walk in the power, to pray in the Spirit. Help me to glorify Jesus. I ask you for this. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Now let's begin to praise and thank God for the Holy Spirit. Come on, just thank God for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hallelujah. So good to be in His presence today. Now there may be some people that are here today and... You've never actually received that gift we spoke of where the Holy Spirit comes inside of you and makes you a child of God, where he, he recreates your heart, takes out the nature of sin and gives you a new nature. But he wants to do that for every person. And he does that when we accept the gift of Jesus Christ, when we open up our lives and say, Jesus, come into my heart. I make you my Lord and Savior. And if you've never done that, you can do that today. And right now, while every eye is closed all over this house, and those who are watching in Life Chapel as well, I want to ask, is there anyone here that would say, I want to be born again. I want to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit in my life. Lift your hand up so I can see it right now all over this house. Thank you, sir. Are there others that would lift their hands and say, I want this gift of the Holy Spirit in my life? Praise the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is for you now. This is for you today. Praise God. There may be others. I want to be born again. I want to know I'm going to heaven. I want my sins forgiven. Let me see your hand. Praise the Lord. Okay. We're going to say a simple prayer right now. And here's what we're going to do. I'm going to say a prayer. I want you to pray with me. But after we pray, if you lifted your hand or should have lifted your hand, 
I want you to step forward when we dismiss because we have a team of ministers at the altar, people who are prayer warriors who are going to take a minute and pray with you and make sure every one of the needs you have in your life are met by the glory of God. So lift up a hand towards heaven and say this with me. Dear Father in heaven, I come before you in Jesus' name. God, I give my life to you. I believe your son Jesus died on the cross for my sins and paid the price so I could be forgiven. I receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Come into my heart. Wash me of my sins. Make me your child. I believe I receive it now. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now let's rejoice and thank God for that right now. Praise the Lord. Friend, if you prayed that prayer, I want you to know God heard that prayer. We believe you're born again. God is giving you a new beginning, a new heart, a new spirit. And now he wants you to walk in a new way that'll change this world forever, change your life forever. Make sure you come forward if you prayed that prayer or need to pray a prayer. We're here to minister to you. Praise the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And may something great happen in your lives this week in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. God bless you. Well, we are just so glad that you were able to join us today. And if you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you can let one of our chat hosts know right now. We have some excellent ministers who are there to talk with you, to speak with you, to, to get you deeper into who the Holy Spirit is so that he can make a difference in your life. You know, we've got a lot happening here at Abundant Life, and we know that you have a lot happening in your life. So if you have prayer requests, if you have needs, let us know. Go to AbundantLife.Church. Let our chat host know. You know, get with another believer and find somebody that you can talk to about those things that you're believing for in your life. But right now, we are just so grateful that you were able to join us today. We hope you have a blessed rest of the week, an abundant week. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.